Hear the word of the Lord. During the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and shouted, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing on him would receive. Because the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So once again, last week when we talked about the Feast of Tabernacles, <coughs> and God coming to tabernacle with and among us, we finished with big question. What about all those people who have not ever heard the Word of God, who have never had a chance to hear about Jesus Christ and His sacrifice and the good news? All those people who have died in the past, what about them? Do they have a chance? How many countless billions of people have gone to their grave not knowing what lies beyond? How many mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, sisters, brothers mourn their loved ones who have died not knowing whether they would ever see them again? Well, the eighth day which is one of the most meaningful, yet least understood, holy days, points to the ultimate completion of God's plan, which is the resurrection and judgment of the vast majority of all the human beings who have ever lived. The destruction of death, the casting away of sadness and mourning, it's a hope that the world so desperately needs, and it will be fulfilled at the culmination of God's plan of salvation for mankind. It'll all come to the end. Now, the Bible does make abundantly clear in Acts 4 that there is no other name under heaven than that of Jesus Christ, by which human beings can be saved. That's clear. But this particular passage also raises some troubling questions for anyone who believes that God is desperately trying to save the whole world in this age. If this is the only time for salvation, and Christ is the only way, then we must conclude that Christ's mission to save humanity has largely failed, right? I mean, after all, over the centuries, billions of people have lived and died without once hearing the name of Jesus Christ. Even now, thousands of people die every day never hearing of Christ. And in spite of all the missionary zeal over so many years and centuries, far more people have died lost than saved. So, some questions that we often hear and may even ask ourselves include, If God is truly all-powerful, why have so many not even heard the gospel of salvation? Doesn't the conflict between God and Satan over the souls of mankind seem to leave God on the losing side of the struggle? Looks that way. What's the fate of all these people? What does God have in mind for those who have never believed in Christ or never understood any of God's truth? How does the Creator provide for them in His plan? Are they lost forever without any hope of salvation? 
He doesn't sound like such a loving God to me. <laughs> We're hearing that more and more, aren't we? Well, as believers, first of all, we should not doubt God's saving power. So let's look at some common assumptions and then come to some understanding of our Creator's marvelous solution. He does have one. Paul tells us that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2. And Peter adds in 2 Peter 3 that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is God's overriding goal in dealing with mankind. He desires as many as possible to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth to receive his gift of salvation. That is also clear. And Jesus explained how this would come to pass. In John 7, 1 through 14, it describes how Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And he appeared publicly and stood in the midst of the people crying out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Well, this most likely happened on the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then the setting moves to the eighth day in John 8 and 9. Christ's teaching in the Gospel here then continues in chapter 8, which is clearly the next morning. It would be the eighth day. And it includes the offer of salvation to all mankind. Now, in Leviticus 23 that we read, we see that this eighth day immediately follows the Feast of Tabernacles. But it's a separate festival with its own distinct meaning. And based on Christ's words and the theme of offering salvation to all mankind, this festival is sometimes referred to as the last great day although the Bible simply calls it the eighth day. So what was the significance of Christ's teaching about living water here? Well, in his day, according to tradition, during the Feast of Tabernacles, the priests would bring golden vessels full of water from the pool of Siloam on the south side of Jerusalem, and bring it in and pour it over the altar at the temple. They'd have a joyous celebration along with the sounding of trumpets as the people would sing words from Isaiah. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And during this time it says Jesus stood where all could hear him and he drew a lesson from the water revealing that all who were thirsty could come to him and be refreshed forever. And in Christ's analogy, the water represented God's Holy Spirit, which those who believed in Jesus would soon receive. He showed that the basic wants of spiritual thirst and hunger could be satisfied only by Him as the bread of life and the source of living water. But when would this happen? That was a big question for them. See, within six months of this time, Christ's own countrymen pressured the Roman authorities to execute him. And about 40 years later, the temple itself was destroyed, and all its ceremonies were brought to an end by the Romans. The whole place ceased to exist. And humanity still hungers and thirsts for the message that Christ brought. We still search for the means to live as we ought to and find true happiness. It's 
2,000 years later. God's promise to pour out His Spirit on all flesh that we read about in Joel chapter 2 has not yet fully taken place. It's still to come. And thousands and millions have died with their deepest spiritual needs unrealized. When will they be refreshed by the life-giving power of God's Spirit? Well, to find the answer, we must consider a question that the disciples asked Christ just before he ascended into heaven, following his resurrection. They asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And they were thinking at that time when they spoke of this restoration about the many prophecies of a reunited nation of Israel under the coming rule of the Messiah. They knew that Israel was lost and needed to be saved. One such prophecy they knew is in Ezekiel 37. And that's the passage that describes a vision of Ezekiel of a valley full of dry bones. And God asks, Son of man, can these bones live? To which the prophet replies, O oh Lord God, you know. Well, God then says to the bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And so in this vision, a physical resurrection takes place. Dead people coming back to life. And it describes the hopeless situation in which these people of Israel had found themselves. They said, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Their Creator, however, offers them the hope of a resurrection and a gift of the Holy Spirit in the setting of a reunited nation. And so, in this dramatic vision, ancient Israel serves as the model for all peoples whom God will resurrect to physical life. All people. You see, Israel did not accept Christ. They rejected and killed him. So they and their temple were destroyed. Should they be saved? God says, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And at this future time, God will make freely available to all the life-giving spiritual water of his Holy Spirit. God says he will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the Apostle Paul also referred to this future event. He said, in Romans 11, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. As Paul further wrote, and so all Israel will be saved. Now this does not mean every single last individual, as some have and will ultimately reject God's offer of salvation. We know that. Some people do. But clearly the majority of the nation will be saved. What will happen to those who turn their back and walk away from God? Well, 
God will bountifully extend the opportunity for salvation to all those who have never known him. But some will still refuse to repent. Some will not submit to God and receive his gift of eternal life. Some people are just like that. What is their fate? Well, Revelation 20 tells us that after the final judgment depicted by the eighth day, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So they will be burned up and cease to exist. Yet not only Israel, but all who have never had a chance to drink from the living waters of God's Word and His Holy Spirit will at last be able to do so. Romans 9 says, What if God, choosing to show His wrath and make His power known, bore with great patience the objects of His wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people, who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one, who is not my loved one. And it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. God will freely offer them the opportunity for eternal life. In Revelation 20, John writes that the rest of the dead did not live again, until the thousand years were finished. So here, John makes a clear distinction between the first resurrection, which occurs at Christ's second coming, and the second resurrection, which takes place at the end of Christ's millennial reign. Remember, the first resurrection is to eternal life, and that's for believers. By contrast, it appears that God raises those in the second resurrection only to a physical flesh and blood existence, as indicated by the dry bones prophecy from Ezekiel. He brings them back to life. John discusses this same second resurrection to physical life that Ezekiel wrote about. He says, then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the, death, the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. The dead who stand before their Creator are all those who died never knowing the true God resurrected from all the different places they died and, and have been. And like Ezekiel's vision of dry bones coming back to life, these people emerge from their graves and begin to know their God. The books referred to are the scriptures, which is the only source of the knowledge of eternal life. And finally, all will have an opportunity to fully hear and understand God's plan of salvation. Now, this physical res resurrection is not a second chance for salvation for those who have rejected him. No, for these people, it is a first opportunity to really know their Creator. 
I've always said in the past when somebody asked me this question or these questions, I'd just say, well, God's going to give them an opportunity. He's fair. He's just. They have to at least come to know the truth, and then it will be up to them. Well, this explains a lot more to that. See, the resurrected are judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books, in the scriptures. This judgment will then involve an evaluation period during which they will enjoy the opportunity to hear and understand God's word and his way of life with an opportunity to have their names inscribed in the book of life. So during this time, billions of people will gain access to eternal life with God. This final commanded festival of the year shows how deep and far-reaching are the merciful judgments of God, greater than we've even thought before. Jesus Christ spoke of the wonderful truth depicted by this day when he compared three cities of his day that failed to respond to his miraculous works with three cities of the ancient world. He said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which were ancient pagan cities, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would, it would have, re have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. See, the people of ancient Tyre and Sidon and Sodom, cities that had known the wrath of God for their wickedness and depravity, they will receive mercy in the day of judgment, he says. Those cities of old had little opportunity to know God, if even to hear about Him. Yet, He will ultimately resurrect these people just after the first thousand years of Christ's reign over the world at the Day of Judgment, including them in that time of great white throne judgment when even those who lived in bygone ages will be reconciled to God. And in similar examples, Jesus refers to the long-dead people of the pagan city of Nineveh, to the Queen of Sheba from Solomon's time, and again to the ancient Sodom and Gomorrah, who were the epitome of wickedness. Now, God doesn't tolerate perversion and sinfulness, and that's why they suffered and were destroyed. But it is clear that he has not finished working in the lives of the people of these ancient generations. And this requires that they be resurrected, brought back to life again, and at last be instructed in God's ways, so they would at least hear and know. And together they will all come to understand the truth about who Christ was and the purpose of life. It'll be a time of universal knowledge of God after the thousand-year reign of Christ here on earth. And those whom Jesus specifically mentioned in these passages, and countless more like them, will at last experience their opportunity for salvation. This final period of judgment completes God's plan of salvation for the world. It'll be a time of love, a time of deep mercy, and the unsearchable judgment of God. The opportunity to drink of the life-giving waters of the Holy Spirit 
will indeed quench the deepest thirsts of men and women. And this time of righteous judgment will bring back to life those long forgotten by humanity, but never forgotten by God. So, what is the fate of those who die with no real knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? What hope is there for the billions who have lived and died without knowledge of God's purpose? Well, the scriptures show that these are not cut off without hope. He will bring them back to life and give them their opportunity for eternal life, to be spirit beings in God's kingdom. They will come up in the resurrection of the great white throne judgment and know God. Every knee will bow to God at this time. And those who lost loved ones will meet them again. There will be no more sadness, pain, or mourning. And that kingdom will last forever. From Revelation 21 it says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Hebrews 2 says, God will see his plan through and bring many sons to glory. And his promise to pour out his spirit on all flesh will find its fullest manifestation. And the thirst quenching waters of the Holy Spirit will be available to all in the time depicted by the eighth day, the last of God's annual festivals. So God's plan looks forward to the fulfillment of what the eighth day pictures, which is the eternal reign of God and Jesus Christ. The new heaven and the new earth, with all mankind having the opportunity to have been purified and set apart to live forever. God speed the day. Amen? Amen. Amen. In the strong name of Christ. Amen.